Just ahead on One Detroit, local Asian Americans gather to remember the victims of two California mass shootings. Plus, American Black Journal Stephen Henderson leads a roundtable on the death of Tyree Nichols at the hands of Memphis police officers. Also coming up, the history behind Black History Month. We'll hear about the significance of the annual celebration. Then, a new exhibition at the Car Center Gallery features the works of local sculptor Austin Brantley. And if you're looking for something to do in Metro Detroit this weekend, we'll have some suggestions. It's all coming up next on One Detroit. From Delta faucets to bear paint, Masco Corporation is proud to deliver products that enhance the way consumers all over the world experience and enjoy their living spaces. Masco, serving Michigan communities since 1929. Support for this program is provided by the Cynthia Essel Ford Fund for Journalism at Detroit Public TV, the Kresge Foundation. The DTE Foundation is a proud sponsor of Detroit Public TV, among the state's largest foundations committed to Michigan-focused giving. We support organizations that are doing exceptional work in our state. Visit DTEFoundation.com to learn more. Nissan Foundation and viewers like you. Just ahead on this week's One Detroit, American Black Journal's Stephen Henderson leads a discussion on the fatal beating of Tyree Nichols by Memphis police officers and the questions it raises about police reform and accountability. Also coming up, it's Black History Month. We'll hear why Dr. Carter G. Woodson created the annual celebration. Plus, women are the inspiration behind Detroit-based sculptor Austin Brentley's new exhibition. We'll talk with the artist about his latest series of work. And we'll tell you about some upcoming events and activities you might want to check out. But first up, local Asian American groups held a vigil in Madison Heights to remember the victims of mass shootings in Monterey Park and Half Moon Bay, California. Both tragedies involved members of the Asian American community and one of the shootings occurred at a Lunar New Year celebration. Uh, this gun violence is, is a public health crisis. It's something that absolutely deserves our attention and our prioritization. State Senator Stephanie Chang talking gun safety legislation following the mass shootings last week in California. Asian American groups led a vigil in Madison Heights, regarded as the unofficial Asian town of Metro Detroit. And we encourage everyone here, Asian American or not, to reach out across lines to find one another and find not only consolation, but also the resources and support that uh, can provide a pathway of healing and safety for those who may be in crisis, who otherwise would turn to a gun or to violence. We need to address the lack of mental health services that is so exposed by this carnage. It's really warming to see everyone come out. This is a time that we just really needed to hold space for our community, that just something to heal together and just really just reflect on just what just happened. You can watch a PBS NewsHour special on the impact of mass shootings and community gun violence tonight at 10 p.m. on the World Channel. Ricochet, an American trauma, focuses on the stories and healing processes of those affected by the shootings. The death of Tyree Nichols at the hands of Memphis, Tennessee police officers has sparked more protests against police brutality and renewed the calls for police reform. American Black Journal host Stephen Henderson sat down with Detroit Police Second Deputy Chief Kyra Joy Hope, Black Lives Matter Detroit co-founder John Sloan III, and licensed clinical psychologist Dr. Aisha Metzger. Lots of people are saying, well, this is black police officers killing a black man somehow is different, um, but it fits very uh, squarely into the narrative that you have been trying to get people to, to pay attention to for some time. Yeah, and, and not just me, um, but there have been activists across the country and across the world that have been saying this since long before um, I started um, having these conversations with you. The, the problem isn't the prejudicial thought. Prejudice is a problem. 
right? But it's the way the prejudicial thought is interwoven into systems in our country that transition prejudice into the ist or the ism, that make a prejudicial thought into racism, right? Um, and allow that privilege and allow that social hierarchy to be maintained, that allow power to be exerted. Um, and what we see in our system of policing is a very clear example of how when you found something on the basis of bias, when you found something on the basis of the criminalization of black and brown bodies, that at a certain point, there be becomes, um, there's an internalization of, of that thought of that system into individuals, regardless of their racial and ethnic identity. Um, and so what has is been really unfortunately very clearly displayed in this situation um, is how this system of policing is deeply, utterly, completely at the root flawed. I want to bring uh, Deputy Chief Hope into the, into the conversation. Um, uh, what, what, John Sloan is saying is that uh, there is no solve uh, for uh, policing as we know it, and that uh, we've got to we've got to do something else. You are uh, one of the people who is in charge of uh, the police department in the largest, uh, the blackest large city in America, Detroit. Uh, Eighty percent of the population is African American. Uh, how how do you respond to this idea that that the problem is policing itself, uh, and that the things that we are doing in Detroit inside the police department uh, to make things better um, essentially don't address the problem? What what would your answer to that be? So first, I'd like to say, Stephen, the actions of these officers were just disgusting and appalling for me. Um, excessive force. Um, is a disregard for life and it has no place in law enforcement at all. And I would have to say my thoughts are with the family and every impacted by Tyree Nichols' death. I would have to say that there needs to be more accountability. There needs to be more transparency in law enforcement. There needs to be better training, intervention programs, uh, as well as crisis intervention mental health co-response, the data-driven enforcement. We need to come together and we need to make sure that we're open for listening to our community for the needs, as well as providing these services that we know are so desperately needed in our communities. You know, I, I have not been able to bring myself to watch the video uh, of what happened to Tyree Nichols. Uh, and that's, that's unusual. For me, um, you know, it's my job as a journalist to, to get as much information as I can about the things that I'm presenting to, to the audience and talking about with, with the audience. And, and uh, you know, as hard as it was to watch videos in the past uh, like this, I always did it. Um, I, I can't get there. I, I wonder in your work, um, what you counsel or what you are counseling people who are in that position. Because I think that's kind of pervasive right now is people don't know what to do with this. I think it's really important to check in with yourself. Like you're saying, if you are used to watching these videos, but you're starting to notice the toll that it's taking on you. Other people will say, I'm becoming desensitized and it's not affecting me at all. So I really need to step back. Right. So really just doing that self check and then determining, OK, what can I do within my position of influence or power or my position within my community or even in my family? Right. We know a large part of the healing that's taking place. Yes, is across news and media platforms like this, but just, you know, going home and checking in with your kids and asking them how they're coping and how they're processing and what their understanding of the justice system is, as well as their sense of safety within that um, system that should protect them, but doesn't look very friendly. And in, 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 in the case of the media looks deadly in most cases, right? Um, so seeking opportunities to challenge those thoughts seeking opportunities to unplug, disconnect, and really just tap into the love and the safety that you do have around you. You can see Stephen's entire conversation on the death of Tyree Nichols on American Black Journal next Tuesday, February 7th at 7.30 p.m. here on Detroit Public Television. Turning now to Black History Month, 
a time to celebrate African American culture and pride. The February observance was founded by noted historian and educator, Dr. Carter G. Woodson, who also created the Association for the Study of African American Life and History, known as ASALA. Stephen Henderson spoke with the organization's president, Dr. Marvin Delaney, about the importance of Black History Month. Thankfully, uh, people are starting to recognize that uh, restricting the idea and the celebration of Black history to a month uh, doesn't make a lot of sense, that Black history is American history, uh, that there are important parts of Black history that show up all over our culture and our, our history. So then I think some people are saying, so why still have a month? I just want to give you a couple of minutes to talk about the importance of maintaining this month-long celebration as well. Sure. You know, I've been engaged in uh, the study of African-American history for, uh, well, I'll say about 50 years. I, I came into this topic when I was an um, uh, undergraduate student at, at Central State University, and I was, I was part of what was called the Black Studies Movement. Mm -hmm. You know, at that time, we were protesting, shutting down universities, um, demonstrating, taking over the president's office, trying to get Black studies as a part of the curriculum, in, both in, in the public schools as well as in, in colleges and universities. It was a long struggle, a long and difficult struggle. And, uh, but here we are 50 years later, basically still trying to struggle to get uh, African-American history and, and culture in, in our schools and, and again, even in some colleges and universities, there's still a fight against it. As you, as you witnessed recently, this whole notion about you know, critical race theory and that it's uh, you know, making white students and, and white people in general you know, feel bad because they have to learn black history and, and read authors such as Toni Morrison you know, 107 years after Carter G. Woodson founded the Association for the Study of Negro Life and History, yet we're still facing this idea that Black history should not be taught in the schools. You know, at least they're at least they're not not now saying like they said, like one of Woodson's teachers told him at, at Harvard that Negroes had no history. Yeah. Uh, but now we're we're facing the fact that whites in general don't want to learn Black history. They think it's, you know, makes them feel bad. And, you know, of course, I always use the line, for some reason, they're ashamed of their, their history when in reality, Black history, as you pointed out, is a part of American history. So we have to continue to do Black History Month because we still don't have the infusion and the comprehensive inclusion of African-American history and culture in, a, in American uh, school curriculums. You know, we, we're still not part of this master nat narrative, except maybe for Martin Luther King and, and Rosa Parks. But as you know, our history goes well beyond Martin Luther King and Rosa Parks. You know, we were a part of almost every aspect of a, and every period of American history, from the colonial period to the American Revolution to the antebellum period, all of the wars from the Revolutionary War to the Civil War, World War I, World War II, and so on. Yet, here we are, as I said, in 2022, still fighting these same old battles that, you know, as I said, it's almost like I've been fighting these battles for 50 years. I can remember in one of my first um, academic appointments, you know, the students asked me, why do you people have to have a whole month to celebrate their, your, you know, our, your history? And of course, they, and of course their, their pushback was, we don't have a month to celebrate white history. And of course, I was able to point out very easily, we celebrate white history every day. All year, right? Every, every month, you know, it's, it's actually, you know, we get, we get overwhelmed by it. We all know the stories, you know, Paul Revere and Abraham Lincoln. And, but indeed, uh, it, uh, those stories in the master narrative usually do not, include yeah they exclude us yeah. yes yeah, our yeah. stories are excluded detroit-based sculptor austin brantley has a new solo exhibition at the car center gallery in midtown detroit 
His series of work is called Muse, and it features clay sculptures, paintings, and drawings of women. One Detroit contributor, Cecilia Sharp from WRCJ Radio, caught up with Brantley at his studio space in the Russell Industrial Center to talk about the exhibit, his upcoming works, and how he communicates through his art. done. And how long um, did you say you worked on this? Uh, I worked on this for about probably four hours at this point. Only four hours to create this much detail? It took me ten years though to learn how to, how to do it in four hours. Right. This is a piece that's in my new series called Muse and what I'm trying to say with it is I'm trying to express something about womanhood. That's a Dogon mass from Africa that I transferred into clay. The reason for that is I feel like um, like African tribes still speak within someone. The figures act as almost thoughts or people or loved ones in your family, um, people that you carry with you throughout your life. And I think about people being landscapes in a way because I feel like the most impactful people in my life have been very strong black women. And the fact that I can get inspired from that and, and think about them as almost like a landform for me to have like made a life on. Um, I think about my work being that too, like a, in a way like a metaphor. So the figures like kind of emerge from the hair. Is that I'm you? To, yeah, that is me. That is, that's you on top, okay, yeah. wow. You have two major pieces coming up. Uh, the piece that honors African-Americans, uh, Henry and Elizabeth Hamer, they were the first African-Americans to buy land in Royal Oak and lived there in 1857 before Royal Oak was a village. And then you're also creating a statue for Detroit Tuskegee Airmen, um, Alexander Jefferson, which will be unveiled maybe next year, 23, 24, uh, in Rouge Park. How does it feel as an African-American sculptor from right here in Michigan to be able to create two pieces that honor African-American legends that are from Michigan? It's a huge honor and also it's a huge responsibility. So I wake up knowing that what I'm gonna do affects people in the future. It's a lot of work um, to imagine what needs to be there. And my voice as an artist is always about kind of making a statement, trying to make something that's gonna, that people can relate to after I'm gone. When there's artwork that makes us think, makes us inspired, and gives us something to reflect on, history is the best thing for that. Talk about how you got started, because it, it started with a, a ceramics class. Mm. What was your introduction into sculpting? I remember the first day I had ceramics and I, I remember taking it as like an easy A. Like I really wanted to just play football with my friends um, and I wanted to kind of just wanted to like fit in more in school. Um, I didn't like standing out. And uh, I remember the first day I thought the clay was so dirty, I went to switch to another class. I was like, I, I need another art class or something. We had this assignment to make pinch pots where we take balls of clay and we pinch it to create these little vessels. Um, and I, I tried that out. It was, it was kind of pretty therapeutic actually, like touching the clay. I thought it was dirty at first and like I didn't want to like- Did you take your I gloves off? Uh, I didn't take my gloves off while I was doing that, okay. but then eventually I took my gloves off when I started just playing around making faces. Maybe after a couple months, we had our first assignment where we could do whatever we wanted. And I drew a figure um, sitting on a rock. And I remember um, my teacher could not believe that I made this thing. He saw me draw it out and then I made it in real life. and. Um, I remember that day, 
that's when he he actually loved this he loved the sculpture more than me he picked it up and then he had this graceful way of showing that you did something right and he would hold it above his head walk around slowly in the class showing talking about the work and why it's important um, talking about the things that you did right and um, he did that for every student that didn't it didn't matter who you were if you did something right it was special I think it really put me on the journey because um, when a kid receives that praise for something that he did um, and no one else has given it to him that that means the world to someone to a child I think I feel like I have this like when I wake up, I feel like I have this like yearning to like ex express something and say something and I'm not a loud person. I, I think a lot of people would say that I'm quiet. The truth is I don't think I'm quiet. I think I just need another way of saying something. I've been told that my work is, is quiet but loud though. That's something to be said um, about making artwork and about knowing yourself as a person is that even if you're a quiet person, you can speak through something else um, and say what you need to say. For me, the way I get inspired is by taking trips to different countries and weird cities and getting lost within them and meeting cool people and doing interesting things. That's what really fuels me as an artist and a person. And it gives me a drive to create something I have solo exhibits that are based around experiences that I have when I travel to different countries. So when I'm traveling to, di to a different country, I'll um, write about it and I'll write, I'll journal my experience. I'll try and like reflect on, on the trip as a whole. And maybe something that I learned on that trip will become the, like this, this one like mantra will become like the title for an exhibition. And then a whole series of works will be created for that title. Um, that's what, so the work almost feels like a, a journal at that point. Austin Brantley's exhibition runs through February 25th at the Carr Center Gallery in Detroit. There will be a closing reception and in-person artist talkback on Friday, February 24th. And now a new weekly feature where we take a look at some of the events and activities taking place in the Detroit area this weekend and beyond. Here's Cecilia Sharp and Peter Worf on WRCJ 90.9 FM with some ideas on interesting places and fun things to do in Metro Detroit. Hi, I'm C Sharp from 90.9 WRCJ. I'm Peter Worf, also from WRCJ, and we're going to talk about some stuff coming up this weekend and maybe into next week that people might be interested in doing around the Detroit area. Sounds good. All right, so what do you want to start with? Do you remember Beetlejuice? Should I say Beetlejuice two more times, yeah. or will there be problems if I do that? Go you for remember it. Go Beetlejuice, for it. Beetlejuice. Beetlejuice! Oh no. Yeah, so if you are a fan of Beetlejuice right. and you like the cartoon yeah. or the movie, well, you can check it out at the Opera House with the live musical of Beetlejuice that's happening. So, all the Beetlejuice fans, go ahead and check out the live musical. Nice. Beetlejuice at Detroit Opera. Up the street at the Museum of Contemporary Art Detroit is artist Bree Grant, and she's going to be giving a talk about her work coming up on February 4th. Her art has been compared to Warhol-style pop art with Afrofuturism, magazine-quality fashion photography, and arrestingly intimate portraits of herself, friends, and other Detroit artists uh, presenting her art on February 4th. People can also head over to Cliff Bells to see Detroit's very own Planet D Nanette as they celebrate the music of Duke Ellington. Take a seat, sit back, have a nice dinner, and enjoy some great jazz music from Planet D Nanette. At the Detroit Institute of Art, it's the Detroit Film Theater with the New York International Children's Film Festival celebrating black stories. So that's a good one for the whole family on Saturday, February 4th with the Film Festival. That sounds really cool. Yeah. And if you feel like going just a little bit further, make your way to the Blue Llama in Ann Arbor 
where Gay Lynn McKinney and the McKinney Zone will also be performing this weekend. The Grammy-nominated drummer and her friends are there to deliver some great music, give the drummer some, and enjoy a night at the Blue Llama. Mm -hmm. Blue Llama in Ann Arbor always has great music. Through the weekend, back to classical music, is the Detroit Symphony Orchestra with the return of music director laureate Leonard Slatkin. Garrick Olson at the piano, they'll be there this weekend, Friday and Saturday. Friday's a live broadcast on the radio that you may know about. Uh, I think that might be on my calendar. <laughs> it should be, right? Right, we're gonna be there uh, hosting the live broadcast on Friday. And then, speaking of classical music, on Tuesday, February the 7th, one of the best violinist on the planet, Joshua Bell, is going to be with the University Musical Society at Hill Auditorium. So we're going to close out the week with the Detroit Public Theater as they present The Peculiar Patriot, which opens on February 8th. Hopefully, we'll see you there. I'm C Sharp from 90.9. I'm Peter War from WRCJ. Have a great weekend. That will do it for this week's One Detroit. Thanks for watching. Head to the One Detroit website for all the stories we're working on. Follow us on social media and sign up for our weekly newsletter. From Delta faucets to Bear Paint, Masco Corporation is proud to deliver products that enhance the way consumers all over the world experience and enjoy their living spaces. Masco, serving Michigan communities since 1929. Support for this program is provided by the Cynthia and Essel Ford Fund for Journalism at Detroit Public TV. The Kresge Foundation. The DTE Foundation is a proud sponsor of Detroit Public TV, among the state's largest foundations committed to Michigan-focused giving. We support organizations that are doing exceptional work in our state. Visit DTEFoundation.com to learn more. Nissan Foundation. And viewers like you.